where I, there's so many people who are excited to see the sun, we surmise that people might actually have taken this break in the rain to mow their lawns. But we have a group of folks who are excited to be here as I am to hear from Chloe Schwenke this evening in the first of our series that's going to go for the next year on the topic of liberation. And fittingly enough, Chloe this evening is going to address the topic, Liberation Begins With Being There, which I think is an open-ended enough title to provide us a number of different ways of looking at what liberation entails. For those of you who don't know Chloe, and for whom I am introducing you, which may also be to our uh, live stream audience at home, welcome. Um, Dr. Chloe Schwanke is an openly transgender, Quaker, author, ethicist, educator, human rights activist, feminist, and international development practitioner. <laughs> and I think there's more than that as well, but I'll leave Chloe to um, elaborate further. Chloe's devoted most of her professional career to supporting people in more than 40 countries in their efforts to achieve lives of dignity, inclusion, freedom, agency, and hope. She's done a considerable amount of work abroad in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and was selected by the Obama administration as a senior political appointee advising on human rights in Africa and on LGBTQ issues worldwide. Um, she is currently an adjunct professor at both the University of Maryland and Georgetown University, and she teaches human dignity at University of Maryland and the ethics of globalization at Georgetown. Um, so a career that has been spent upholding and helping people to achieve human dignity and human rights around the world and a personal struggle to achieve who she is that I think is part of the uh, concept behind her book title which is called Selfish, A Transgender Awakening. So being there I think has both personal dimensions for liberation and global dimensions, which I imagine that Chloe will touch on this evening. The book will be available for sale in the bookstore, which will be open shortly um, after the um, program concludes. We'll have a period of question and answer. I'd appreciate it if you would now turn off your cell phones and other devices that make noise. and we'll settle into a period of quiet worship out of which Chloe will speak to us. When it comes time for question and answer, I'll come around with the microphone so that we make sure that we capture your questions for the people at home and for our videotape, which will be on our YouTube channel uh, shortly after the topic concludes. Um, and if you would wait for the microphone to arrive and if you would speak into it just the way I'm speaking into it now, Right, right on your lower lip. That'll be great. So let's settle into a period of worship and then welcome Chloe. We're so glad you're here tonight.
Well, thank you all for being here. It's great to see you all, and thank you for those out in the outer world, wherever you are. <laughs> it's always an interesting thought to think about, who are those people out there? But anyway, <laughs> I'm sure you're there, and I welcome all of you being here. The name of my talk is Liberation Begins with Being There. And as I sat to think and ponder and put together what I might share with you tonight, I got stuck on the very first word, liberation. It's such a big word. It's such a big thought. And when you start matching some of the people that are associated with liberation, there's some big people. They're really <clears throat> somewhat overwhelming, even intimidating in its bigness. So, what am I going to say about something that big and that challenging? So I said, okay, well, let me stop thinking about people and just go with the imagery. <laughs> and even there, I got into trouble because all this stuff, sort of heroic stuff comes to mind. You know, man the barricades, blow the trumpets, you know, we'll get the liberation is about to begin, you know, out on the streets. This is heroic stuff. This is the stuff of great drama and sometimes great tragedy. But it's definitely not small. This is not a peripheral topic. This is something that takes over. This is something that is center stage. So I didn't get a whole lot further in finding a comfort zone by thinking about, well, let's just think about the imagery. <clears throat> but then I stopped to think about, this isn't just imagery. This is reality for so many people. Even this country, but certainly in so many of the countries where I've worked and lived, where oppression and exploitation and injustice is such, so commonplace, it's almost the norm. And people have gotten to a place where they really have just, this is life, this is what we have to live with. The, the, the very prospect of being liberated from that kind of exploitation, that kind of oppression, is really unachievable. It's just beyond their scope. They have enough to do just, just staying alive. So I've been in many environments where liberation was a very faint hope at best, and really not something that was worth much discussion about. All those times that I was there, though, it was me as an American looking at them. And it's particularly poignant right now to be thinking about us and to be seeing such challenges to some of the most fundamental norms and values that we have cherished over the years, that were so embattled in those other countries and suddenly are so embattled here. So liberation becomes relevant in a really powerful way for even you know, good old comfortable Americans, and that's hard. You know, we, we've elected people, we've chosen people, we've entrusted people to defend those values, to defend those norms. And by and large, they're not doing it, at least the ones with the power to do it, the ones who've entrusted and given the power to do it, are not liberating us from that threat. So right away, I mean, I was in a place of saying, well, this is, this is, this is particularly poignant right now when we're looking at this. So, I don't want to start this or, or carry this through, though, with nothing but somber and depressing news. But, you know, I live in Washington, D.C., and it's not a happy place right now. <laughs> um, the only good news coming out of Washington, D.C. right now is with the Washington Capitals. So go Caps! <laughs> That's about the only good thing I can share at the moment that's really, really strong. But let's think about some of the exemplars. Let's go back to the people and see, well, what can we glean from their lives? What have they got to either teach us or inspire us with? And, you know, we can think pretty quickly of a lot of people that would fit that liberator name. And, of course, if you go online and you say the liberator, who comes up first? William. No, actually, Simon Bolivar. You know, that's... that's the one that we're all looking at right away, and you know, he, he liberated five countries. I mean, that was no small feat. Got those Spaniards out of there, and suddenly we have Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela, free and independent countries. So there's a liberation model, but that's fairly bloody and political and military, so probably not the best model for this particular crowd, and not for me either. 
But that's a model. That's one of the models that's out there. We could look at, I don't know, Thomas Paine, who was really the architect of so many of our democratic institutions, and was quite a remarkable man for his time in that he was a strong proponent of social justice and on issues like um, slavery, on women's equality. I mean, this was not what guys were doing back then. And yet, there he was, being incredibly outspoken as a proponent of liberating people who were essentially enslaved or otherwise constrained to such a point that they were not living truly human lives. But, you know, that's a very political figure as well. And it's been a long time since Thomas Paine was kicking around. There are a lot of other people, though, that we can think of that are more recent. People like Nelson Mandela, people like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., people like Oh, I don't know, you can pick a, the list goes on and on, actually. People that could inspire us and sometimes motivate us to action that we might not otherwise do. If we stop about and think a, a little bit about what was their liberation struggle? What were they about? And why were they in that leadership position? What brought them to be there to do that kind of work? So, I mean, you know, you can look at like Jane Addams, who was the, the person who started social work. What led her to do that? You know, that was an amazing thing. Or Margaret Sanger, I mean, the woman that really turned our attention to women's health and, you know, ultimately led to Planned Parenthood being founded. These are people that are liberators in a way that we might not think about it right away, but they liberated our thinking and our consciousness in a way that was really important to how we become who we are right now, which is really important. So it's not a lack of positive exemplars for liberation and liberators. Um, you know, some of them were Quakers. Some of them were in, some of them were very influenced by Quakers. But when we think about their work, and we look at even the work of Dr. Martin Luther King, and we see what's going on now, we're aware that this is a very fragile accomplishment. That we have still a long way to go as a species, as a human race, to get to an evolution where those pieces of our human nature were able to overcome the bad parts. We're able to move to a place where we really honor and respect notions like human dignity, notions like care and compassion, notions like equality, where they're no longer notions, where they become realities for us. We are not there now. And we're see, feeling very embattled with some of those notions right now. And many of us are feeling really challenged to resist those, those attacks on things that we value and claim that space and say, no, we have achieved this. We're not letting it go. Liberation needs to be fought for in whatever way and sustained through a lot of hard work. It's not something you can sort of just sit back and enjoy. But if you think about those people and those struggles, it's, you know, that's not us. That's, those are like big people. Remember I started talking about big people. These are big people. And how do we relate to those kinds of people? I mean, they're on a different sort of level, different strata than, than us mere humans. These are people that are heroes. And it's like, well, I'm not a hero. <laughs> I would like to be helpful. I would like to be part of a liberation movement. But am I called to leadership? Am I in that sort of heroes category? You know, probably not for most of us. That's really, really scary. And it doesn't, it's not a gift that we all sort of have or fall into naturally. But there is something really important about, first of all, acknowledging the leadership that comes from such people, and acknowledging that followership has a really important dimension too. Followership is not a passive act. The best followership is very active indeed. We're not only holding those leaders to their visions and asking them to constantly refine their visions and then working to keep those visions alive when the leaders are gone. That's part of followership. But it's also something that we're using their vision and their example and their liberation to change ourselves, to do really important work on the inside. And that's a really big piece of that. We have to do some discernment. 
we have to do some, you know, achieve some sense of really understanding our own identity. And we have to do some work about evaluating the values. Evaluating values. Those words are important <laughs> that they are connected in that way. Evaluation means placing yourself in relationship to what matters in your life. So getting the values right is not easy. It's, it's a long process to get it, you know, to even ask the question, to even surface the values, to even start to make those apparent, and it doesn't always happen. But that's where I started to connect with this topic, discernment. Well, that's what Quakers try so hard to do, and hopefully we're led to always better discernment. Identity. We have so much work to do, not just for individual identity, but identity as a faith community, identity as people of friends of the truth, friends of the light, friends that are trying to create a different sense of what it means to be a community in this world. And values, asking those hard questions, putting those values into the light, really saying, <coughs> is this relevant anymore? Is this really describing who I am and what I'm about? And from doing all of that, what we find is we're doing a process of liberation. We're actually liberating, first and foremost, ourselves. But we're also liberating our own faith communities. And hopefully, and I think it needs to be more than we're doing right now, our faith communities can be liberating the possibilities for other people as well. So we have work to do. And it's work that draws upon the things that we do, I think that's that kind of really thoughtful discernment that we do. But we have to do something about the identity piece. And that's not easy. We have to start with a real bit of stop taking of who we are. And that's an important thought that in our process that we often don't give enough time to. It's not something we stop our busy lives and say, wait a minute. <laughs> Where do I stand on that issue, and, and why, and what's driving my particular views on that perspective? Some of that comes from just who we are, how we were raised, the lives that we've led, the people that influenced us. We, we just pull that stuff in, and we no, don't necessarily interrogate it. You know, our, what our parents and our mentors sort of convey to us, we absorbed in the metamorphosis somehow that we came out the other side of that and we recognize some of those traits and values as, oh, that's, like, that's what my mom used to say, or that's what Uncle Fred used to say. But we haven't necessarily interrogated those values. They just kind of become us. And we have a challenge then, an opportunity to say, well, maybe I need to stop and stop saying that's who I am and say, well, wait a second, <laughs> who is that person? What are those values? And is this really where I am right now? So that interrogation of values is part of that stop take, taking. A lot of that's not just secular values, they're spiritual values too. You know, when I talk to this particular community about a spiritual journey, we know what that means. But we often don't know how to describe it very well. And we don't know necessarily how to place ourselves in that journey very well. I would like to challenge you to, to try harder, to really think about where am I on this journey and how would I communicate that to somebody else? But really, what I'm asking you to do is how do I communicate that to myself? How does that inform my identity of who I am so that I can place myself on issues that need some liberation input? that needs some vision, that needs some drive, that needs some motivation and inspiration. To do that, and I think it's a message from my own life, is that really where it all starts when you're doing that kind of an evaluation is with the, the challenge to yourself to be present, to be there. When I first put this title for John said, what does there mean? It can mean anything. And I said, yes, <laughs> it can mean anything. And that's exactly the challenge, is to get it so that it means something, not anything. And that's where it starts. It starts by actually thinking inward and reflectively, introspectively, prayerfully, contemplatively, that's actually got a lot, um, about what is this place that we call there? 
And why is, and why is that place the place where we start? So that was my challenge, to say, okay, if we really think that being there and being you know, it, uh, somebody that is in a liberation process means with starting with being present for that liberation process, and that in turn means being present to yourself as yourself, what does my life, Chloe's life, have to say to you about that? Well, as you can imagine for anybody who's transgender, there's a lot of introspection that goes on in that process. And finding out, well, who is this person came up with some rather <laughs> dramatic results when I started really looking into that. This person was a pretty miserable person. This person was a person that was very much on a track that did not get me there, wherever that there is, but which confounded the daylights out of me. It was really hard to understand why I wasn't there. What was going wrong? What was that emptiness? What was that hollowness that stood in the way of me being that either that leader or that active follower that owned herself, that owned her identity, that knew where she stood, that was comfortable saying, this is me, this is where I stand, this is what I value, and this is why. That's not easy for anybody to do, but for somebody born in the wrong body, <laughs> it's incredibly challenging because it just doesn't work. And it doesn't work in a way that most of society is not able to explain or even to <clears throat> comprehend that as a possibility. And you've got these really unusual models of people that, remember I mentioned earlier about those who passed on their values to us, and parents are the best example of that, but so are teachers, so are friends, so are mentors. These are the people that essentially said, you are crazy to think that you're a girl. <laughs> And they said it lovingly, and they said it with great care and compassion, and they said it with complete conviction, and these are the people I trusted the most. They said, that's not where there is for you. You're confused. You're wrong. Don't go there. It took me over 50 years to go there. And that's a, you know, that's a tribute to how comprehensive our socializing processes are. For men and women, our socializing processes are lousy for people in between men and women. But for the gender binary as it's existed for centuries, for millennia, this is what societies do. And they're really good at it. For the daughter of a Marine Corps colonel, <laughs> they were particularly good at it. And they did it with love, but they did it with discipline. And with very little latitude for pushing back for somebody who was at that time a child. So being there was particularly challenging for me when I had everybody saying no. And people would then say, well, how do you know you're there now? <laughs> it's like the easiest thing in the world, because I'm happy, because I'm at peace for the first time in my life, because I actually feel at home in my bones for the first time in my life. I feel like I'm be on an entirely different threshold. This is so different than what my life was like before. It's actually beyond my powers of description to say what it's like to be here in this form of there, in this body, in this body. Does that mean that nothing remains from Stephen? I don't think so. I think there were lots of pieces of that being there that had real importance, real relevance, real authenticity, real value. And part of my process, and I think it's actually to some extent everyone's process, is what do we carry forward? What do we incorporate from past parts of our lives? Parts that may be really uncomfortable for us or that really didn't fit then. It might fit in a different way right now. And we need to give us space to think through even parts that seem very, very odd in retrospect. And there are definitely parts of me from those days that I'm going to own and claim. And some of them are frivolous and fun. I still like motorcycles. I'm not going to get over that. 
Um, you know, there's parts that are more identified with the masculine in life. I'm not a shy and retiring person. I was socialized to be strong and assertive, and I'm strong and assertive, so get used to it. I'm not going to let that go, and why should I? You know, but that's what our society does. We, we socialize boys to be that really outward, push yourself, get out there and do it, don't complain. And girls are not given those messages. Being the mother of a daughter, it's been just an amazing experience to watch the messaging through her eyes that society throws at young girls. Because I didn't pick up on that. And I'm picking up on it now, big time. It's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe that's going on. So trying to get there for me was not just the physical, and certainly not just the financial, although that was a big, that was a big part of it. It cost a fortune to be in this body. <laughs> but it was worth every penny. But fundamentally, it was a spiritual transition, as much as anything. My being there, and being there means being here right now in front of you, is the result of a decade and a bit of very intensive spiritual journey. And some of you have seen me all the way through this, and John has as well, um, and so has Tracy. Others that you know, knew me as Stephen, and been very comfortable to accept me as Chloe. Oh, this is the difference. <laughs> but that's a journey. That's a journey of getting there. And I think it was Michael, was, um, is this story or Michael? No, you, is it Michael or Dan? Michael. Michael, yeah. You, you said, well, how do you know when you're there? <laughs> and it, you kind of know because somehow you feel that the messaging goes through you. You're, you, you're in a place where you, you just are able to be sufficiently grounded that your followership uh, touches other people. And that can change by the context. It's not like a temporal thing, like I'm, I'm there, I'm here now, and I will be here forever, and everything is done, and I've finished my spiritual journey, and I'm all accomplished, and I've got a big certificate. <laughs> no, but for certain contexts, I feel the voice move through me, and I let it happen, and it's, it's humbling, it's a little frightening at times, but it's liberating for me and for others. And I'm in awe of it. And that's part of being there, is to let that awesome thing, which is much of these words, but I use it occasionally, let it happen. Let it happen, let it actually move other people. So being me, certainly started with self-awareness about really who this person was and what was going on those 50 years. And it's so interesting now to look back and see that yeah, Chloe was there all the time. And she showed up in the most interesting ways and I wasn't smart enough to figure it out. But looking back, isn't, isn't hindsight wonderful? Looking back, there she was and there she was and there, I mean, one of the best years I had was my father's last year. I came out to my dad when he was 91 years old. And God bless him, he, he, uh, he not only acknowledged me, but he absolutely loved having another daughter. <laughs> and he shared from that point, right, you know how some elderly people remember things with remarkable clarity? He started recalling these episodes that happened when I was very small, where I was very feminine, <laughs> and it confounded the daylights out of him at that time, and he never was able to figure it out. And they all came back, and he was sharing those with me, and it was such a gift mm -hmm. to say, oh yeah, there's Chloe. <laughs> and she showed up in lots of different spaces, so that was important. Integrity was an important piece of me being there. Integrity meaning wholeness putting all these different pieces, some from Stephen, some liberated now by being Chloe, some that are just happening now, into some sense of wholeness, harmony, you know, some place that it's going. It's very dynamic to feel that integrity take shape and cohere, and then find the hard edges sometimes when it does it, and say, okay, I've got my work to do there. Faith has been a really important part of this. Um, for a lot of what my particular journey has been involving, there are no answers. We're at such an early stage of the science of what happens to transgender people. There's a, you know, there's not a lot of us, but there's a lot of us, if you know what I mean. There's enough of us telling our stories now that we start seeing some really profound, 
commonalities between us. And that is challenging people in their thinking in a way that saying, well, you know, these people are putting together very solid, whole, integrated, well-knit lives, even when they shouldn't be. <laughs> even when, you know, tradition says this shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, I'm really happy as Chloe, and it's all coming together and having that integrity and finding that space through my faith journey, my spiritual journey, is really knit this together. Duty has been a big part of my journey, too, in finding what my liberation challenge is. And that came at me unexpected when I got that call from the State Department saying, can you come down for your job interview? And I said, I think you have the wrong number. <laughs> I hadn't applied for a job with the State Department. I hadn't applied for a job with the Obama administration. But the Human Rights Campaign had put my name for it, and they forgot to tell me. <laughs> so before I knew it, I was down at the State Department being interviewed for a political appointee job, and it was bizarre. And they said to me early on, you know, this sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? This is, um, like, you know, this is exciting stuff to be a senior political advisor. You know, you'll have essentially you know, this really high rank to be like somebody in the administration will go to the White House every month, and I did. But you'll never be a private person again. Forever and ever, when somebody Googles you, they will know immediately that you're transgender. They'll know that you are one of the first three transgender appointees ever. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it's really a problem. And it's been a big problem for me in ways that are not worth talking about tonight. But I owned it. And it's been part of what I've learned to just take on as a duty to not just that particular political administration, which I deeply admired and most of all the time, <laughs> but a duty to trans people around the world. And I got that, at, when it, it took 14 months, six interviews and lots of processing, and I was the very first, <laughs> maybe still the only, transgender person ever to get a top secret clearance, and the people that do that have no idea how to do that, <laughs> a trans person. And they were polite about it, right? No, I said, uh, they said, is this an awkward question? I said, no. <laughs> anyway, um, when it was announced, what was really cool was the messages I got from transgender people, particularly in the global south, in developing countries, who said in their messages, essentially, wow. <laughs> that was really what their messages were. I'm talking scores of emails. But what they were really saying was, Somebody, somewhere, is respecting a transgender person for being competent, smart, able, dignified, there, for being there, being there and available for a struggle which was fundamentally about liberation of a nation, of norms, of what it means for an African American to be president, of what it means for diversity to be celebrated instead of tolerated. This is a really different way of thinking. And for me, it was just profound to have that happen and have that example go out to the world. And then all these people essentially saying, wow. But that was a weight on my shoulders. That was a weight of saying, Chloe, you're carrying hope for us. Don't blow it. <laughs> and I still carry that weight. And I carry it as cheerfully as I can, but that sense of duty and obligation is heavy. And it's something that I could not possibly do without my meetings to support me. Delphi Meeting has been an incredible resource in holding me up in the light again and again and again to find the spiritual energy to do that particular piece of heavy lifting, which it has been. And that's about service, too. That's about being sufficiently supported and empowered and safe enough. Safe is a, is a vague term. Safe in the sense of being held in the spirit. I'll put it in that terms. To be safe enough to be able to be there for other people. Two weeks ago, I was in a pride parade in Kishinev, Moldova. And there were far more protesters against, I mean, virulently anti-LGBTQ people lining the streets, 
I would guess thousands, I was going to say that's maybe an elaboration, but at least hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of police officers and look like sort of Star Wars armored uniforms all in black on either side of us trying to keep us from getting totally attacked by these people. But I marched there and I felt safe and I felt this is where I need to be. This was the there where I was called. And I was in that space with the Swedish ambassador. I was there with Peace Corps volunteers. I was there with incredibly courageous Moldovan LGBTQ people and allies. <coughs> And that's what being there was for me at that moment. And it meant the world to me to do that. And my safety was really more about our safety and the ability to keep us as a movement alive and, and vital. So this is all part of me being me right now. And this is really big for me right now. Um, this is about a spiritual journey that I'm being to show up for, it means I have to show up in a way that I'm alert, that I'm, I'm ready, that I'm prepared for the journey, and the journey has so many pieces to it. So I show up, I show up in the right shoes, I show up in the right frame of mind. Uh, those shoes, by the way, are girl shoes, and they're really good for long journeys, despite what everybody says about girl shoes. I'm making that journey, I mean, watch me run. I, I am 67 years old now, and I'm not about to slow down. And that's where this is moving me right now. That's what being there for me means right now. So I lean on those attributes that I mentioned, the, the self-awareness, the integrity, the faith, the duty, the service, the discernment that I talked about. But more than anything, I lean on and into and completely depend upon love. I could not do this if, you know, I only had those people screaming at me in Moldova, for instance, if that was my world. And one of the, the most scary parts of that particular pride march was when some of those protesters tried to crash through the police lines. The police lines held, but in the middle of that, what really held us together was a lesbian couple right in front of me who just held its hands and started kissing each other. <laughs> and it just was just, I mean, the entire crowd of us just cheered. I mean, that, that was the love that just, that's what we have. That's our power. That's what drives us. And that's strong. That's so much stronger than all that hate that was being thrown at us, and the eggs that were being thrown at us, and the water balloons that were being thrown at us. I'm not sure they were actually having water inside, there were other things, but anyway. That's what was going on. So, my particular journey is a journey of gender. And gender is not the same as sex. I was sexed male, and I was female from birth. And if you can get that in your heads, you've come a long way, more than most people can, can understand. They just don't get this thing called transgender. Sometimes one of the best ways of explaining it is, because you know, I get called gay all the time, I'm a heterosexual woman. I'm not gay, but we don't even know enough to say, this is something different. And the only way I've been able to say that is, it's not who you go to bed with, it's who you, to go, to, who you go to bed as. That's the identity that I'm talking about. I depend on my gay friends. My gay friends are my best friends right now. They're, that's my community, and obviously other trans people, and the allies that support us. But I'm not gay. So I have to, I'm always trying to get people to understand that my identity is really important, that don't make assumptions about any person's identity. <coughs> Give them the space to own it. Give them the space to articulate it. Give them the space to say why it's important. Give them the space to say, this is where they are coming from. And things happen. Things open up that, you know, were not there before. The idea that trans is not gay, oh, well, what does that mean? Oh, this is something different. I can't tell you how many times people have had that reaction. They just had never stopped to think that this is not all one big homogenous group. This is different people with different situations, with different ways of being there, and with particularly different liberation struggles before them. 
we in the transgender community are at least 20 years behind where gay and lesbian and bisexual people are now, even bisexual is a fairly new, <laughs> new ownership, it's always been there. But we're in different places, and those struggles require the liberation of the mind, first of all, and the attitudes of people to be even willing to try it out in the sense of this idea, she's saying this is what this is, I've written a book about what this is. What is she saying? Is she really there? Is that the there that she's talking about? And what is that space? What does it look like? People often ask me, well, you know, are you happy being Chloe? And I, I often don't even answer. I just smile. Because it's just so pervasive. It's as happy as I've ever been being Chloe. It's not that sort of frivolous, sometimes it is, but it's not sort of a yah ya yeah, with you know, scream of the rooftops happiness. It's a really deep, centered, grounded kind of happiness that fills me with peace. And I say that with a certain degree of, I don't know the right word. Almost, it's, a, it's, it's bittersweet. And I'll say why. Because the place I am at right now, the peace, the happiness, the groundedness, the clarity of mind and spirit, I was there once before, before I was Chloe, before I owned Chloe. And that was a Stephen, and that was in 2007, and that was the day I decided to take my life. I had lived a life that had been progressively more hollow, more empty. I had learned so well all those lessons of being there as Stephen. I had been so socialized. We were really good at processing gender. That's what we do as society. And I was processed, and I was really good at it. I was a successful career person. I had a wife and two kids. I had. You know, everybody who knew me, invested in me, knew of me as Stephen. This was not something to simply walk away from. And I didn't even know what transgender was at that time. I just knew that my life made no sense. That nothing worked anymore. There was just such an emptiness in that, in that spiritual center of me. And nobody could reach it. I went to the best therapist I could go to. I got a lot of general support from the meeting, but I didn't know how to explain it to them, so how, what could they do? So, suddenly there I was in Silver, in Silver Spring, Maryland. I just left the last <laughs> counselor therapist. I'd been to so many, and she basically said, there's nothing more I can do for you. You know, this just doesn't make sense to me either. It's beyond my skills. And I walked at that door, and I stood on that street, and I could not take another step. My there, at that moment, was as low a point as a human being can get to. But there was clarity in that space. And what was really, I, I guess it's frightening in a way, but it's important. It's an important kind of frightening awareness that when I made that decision, there was a remarkable degree of peace and integrity and wholeness that settled on me. Finally, there was a choice. I mean, it's tragic, it's really sad, but finally, there was something I could do. And God had other plans. God had, I guess, I'm going to put it all on her shoulders. Um, I had agreed with a friend before I came to this conclusion, and I shared with her my desperation of finding a good counselor, and I shared with her that this was my last meeting with this other counselor, and she said, like a lot of people do, you've got to see my counselor. You've got to go talk to this person. You know, she's great. Well, this was a dear friend, and I made her promise that I would go to her counselor at least once. And that was really strong to me when I made that decision. I said, okay, before I act on this decision, i got to go see that silly counselor because I made that promise. I went to see that counselor. And it was like every other counselor, 40 minute session, I taught my spiel. But she listened, and she listened really well. And she listened not just with her ears and really with her eyes, but she listened with her heart. 
And at the end of that 40 minutes, when I was just getting ready to walk out in frustration yet again, she looked at me and said, have you ever thought you might be a woman? I was 56 years old. I had never, ever heard anybody ask me that question. And what's more important is I've never asked myself that question before. It was way too big of a question for me to ask myself. And this was 10 years ago, 11 years ago, and there was not as much talk about transgender. I mean, we like those weird people over there. We didn't have the sort of internet resources. I didn't know diddly about trans people. This therapist said, you may be transgender. I don't have that competence to help you in that sense, but here's somebody who does. And she gave me the name of the counselor and all the rest is history. But the real change, the real there, and it's the one that probably, I would say definitively, the most there I've ever been, ever, was when she asked me that question, because everything changed. Everything changed. My entire world changed, and suddenly, I mean, even though it was chaos, as you can imagine, something of remarkable light and brilliance and clarity and truth shone out from that chaos and all that dust and rubble, there was something I could not deny. And all of it came together from that perspective. And, you know, the rest really has been history. It was what drove me from that point onwards. So that there was my path. That was my really big point in the spiritual journey for me, to be authentic to be myself, to own myself. And that is not just something that transgender people do. It's something we all do if we are led to do it, if we have the determination to do it. So, I don't know. I mean, that's that challenge for me to you to explore what it means to be there, what it, what it means to be authentic, is really an invitation more than anything to do that unpacking, to do that inventory, that stock taking I talked about before, to start thinking about the values that you think are important in your life. And you don't do this on your own necessarily. It's so much better if you do this with, with a, a bunch of friends, with people that you care about, through discussions, through whether you want to call it a spiritual discipline or not. I think it is. But to start interrogate, first of all, make the values explicit. And think about where they come from. And think about the fact that values are not all the same. Some of them are very tied to particular family, clan, culture, tradition, very local, relative values. There's nothing wrong with that. That's an important part of defining this, too. But there are values that we have come to own and identify as being universal. And human dignity is at the center of that. I'm asking you to find your dignity. That's your assignment. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an incredible invitation when you start to do that, when you start to unpack. First of all, you can, you can use the human rights framework, you can think about those, those are universal values that there's a strong consensus for. You can use your own Quaker values. Those are another framework in a spiritual context that throws a lot of light on what's important to you and why what it means for you to be there in terms of those values. And there, there are literally thousands of values. And the last anecdote I'm going to share tonight is when I, when I was at USA as a, as a appointee, one of my assignments was to go, I was asked by the, the Council of Chiefs of Western Ghana, in Takaradi, Ghana, to please come out and talk to them because they needed some money. <laughs> And everybody needs money from the USA, and that's what it's about, and it's appropriate. But when I went to Ghana, I've been there many times, but when I went there that time, it was election season. And when I was still in Accra before I'd gone out to the city of Takarati to meet with the chiefs, the chiefs, by the way, still have lots of power, even though there's you know, democratic structures, the traditional values and roles of chiefs is still huge in that culture. Well, I went to a political rally, which I always kept going to, and this was a debate. This was, you know, a typical candidate's debate. 
And there were eight candidates for this member of parliament position, and I, and I just you know, went with a friend and we just decided, let's go get this debate. Seven of the eight candidates were men. One woman. And this was a fairly rowdy bunch. People had drunk probably way too much beer. It was nearly all men that were in that particular hall. And with, you know, fairly drunken good nature, they would roast these people that got up and gave their little political spiel. But it was all kind of good fun. And the candidates, most of them were able to roll with the punches and actually still say something important until the woman got up. And of course she was last. Surprise, surprise. Um, and everything changed. It was no longer a jocular repartee. It was no longer, let's just have some fun. It was highly sexualized, highly offensive. It was crude. It was derogatory. It was deprecating in the extreme, stigmatizing. It was awful. It was awful. And, you know, they called her every name you could think of that was offensive to women. And all, her only crime was that she was standing for Parliament. So with this experience, I went out to see the chiefs. And the chiefs said, we are the guardians of culture in Ghana. And they meant it. They were very proud of that. And so I told them the story at the political rally. And I said, are you the guardians of female Ghanaians as well? Are you the guardians of your women and girls and their value in society as well? And if so, could you help me to understand what I just went through in that, that debate? And there was silence. And finally, one of the elder chiefs said, we still have much work to do. And I said to him, okay, well, let me see you do that work. I want to hear from you, and I, it's an invitation, I'm not issuing instructions, but if you want U.S. taxpayer money, I have to be able to justify that. And I will justify that to the extent that you are the guardians of Ghana's values and culture. All Ghana's, not just male Ghana's. Give me something that I can show my people back home when I'm justifying this. Oh, it's fairly large than the money they were asking for. That you're doing this work that you're making those values explicit, the good ones and the bad ones. There's some really bad values, particularly around women. Identify them, make them understood, talk about them, and throw them out when they don't fit anymore. And they didn't know quite, I mean, they said yes. They thought that was a really important and noble idea. But I have friends who were in an NGO, nonprofit there, who were in the room with me. Women. And they kind of chuckled themselves because they wanted to see what the chiefs were going to do too. And they went away and I went away and they emailed me about three weeks later saying, we're tired of waiting. They went to the chiefs, not just them, but with young Ghanaian men and women, and they proposed the project to quite literally write down values. Talk to old people, look at the old stories, think about the songs, think about the speeches, and try to make values explicit in this context specifically about gender and gender equality. They found a lot of them, and they threw out more than two-thirds of them, and they got their money. <laughs> so that was a liberation. That was a liberation of attitudes. It was a liberation of dignity for all. It was a liberation of of the way things were and will no longer be as long as it's sustained, as long as it's nurtured, as long as people stand firm for those values, that people stand up for what they believe in, as long as people are there. And that's why liberation starts with being there. So thank you. Happy to take any questions, comments, device of criticism, whatever. Thank, thank you. We don't have any water balloons or anything <laughs> like that. But thank you so much. Do friends have questions that you'd like to ask Chloe? I just, I knew you would have it. You, you're good at starting us off with something very <laughs> provocative, always. 
for which we are great. <laughs> provocative is good enough. Actually, I, uh, it's not very provocative, but I would love to hear some more stories of what you did for the Ghanaian, for the Obama administration. Okay. In rec did you also represent individuals who were going through the sort of thing you went through, or groups of them? transgender, LGBT, in other countries that you came to their rescue is all I can yeah. to say. You know, I, I, it makes me really proud to talk about this because it shows what government can be. But we were, there were three of us that were transgender appointees. One was in the Department of Labor, Illinois, transgender man. And Amanda Simpson, who was originally in the Department of Commerce, but then went to the Pentagon, which is really bright in the department. <laughs> But the three of us were summoned to the White House fairly early on in our appointment, like after about two months, and we were still pretty green. And we were terrified. You know, we were going to be meeting with really senior people, one echelon down from the president, you know, the chief of staff of the White House, and many senior people. And we wondered, what can we say? What can we do? <laughs> this is really scary. And we sat in this room at the White House with seven people looking at us, and they looked and said, tell us what we can do for you. What can we do for you and your constituency? Because they recognized that we were each, and I was the one talking about international LGBTQ. And you know, the other two had their own constituency that were important, and our own networks which were important. And we told them, I mean, we hadn't prepared anything, but it was really clear, you know, from my perspective, it's so important that people, especially trans people, stop getting killed for a start. But even even more, I said, you know, we have to put not pressure so much as strong encouragement on countries to recognize the legality, the legal there of trans people who essentially do not exist within their cultures because they're not only are their names not legally recognized, but their gender markers are not legally recognized, so they can't get employed, they can't vote, they can't fly on a plane, they can't get any, they can't get a job. I mean, there's just nothing they can do because they do not exist legally. And I said that's part of the human rights language of the White House to be so strong in promoting the bareness of the humanity, the dignity of LGBTQ people generally, but in this case trans people specifically. So that was something they took on board, and every month after that that we went there, they reported out to us what they had done on the list that we gave them. And they asked for what else can we do. And they convened many uh, events at the White, right at the White House, where they would invite, for instance, with my constituency, they would invite and pay for LGBTQ people to come from the Global South to meet in some cases, the, the vice president, but even once President Obama too, and Michelle Obama, which was wonderful. Um, this was no sort of trivial thing. These were, this was phenomenal for these people and for me. I have a wonderful picture in the West Wing of sitting down with Vice President Biden and seven LGBTQ leaders from around the world. I mean, that's a cherished picture for me, just, just by the symbolic reaching out to us as a community was so important. So that's, I mean, that's what White Houses do, but we did more. I, mean, I, was, I was invited, encouraged, <laughs> basically told, to come up with a policy at USA for LGBTQ people. You know, what can, what, what can USA do to better serve the human rights needs, the democracy needs, the governance needs, the, the foreign assistance needs of this community? And I did it. I worked with a group of people. We came up with a policy. It's still there. It's not active right now, as you can imagine. <laughs> and we did a lot of sort of more subtle things. Um, I, I had a number of sort of co-conspirators where we got into the regulations. We got into the, the works of the machine and made sure that in every opportunity where diversity could be built into the process, we built it in. It will take them years to get that all out. <laughs> so we did that, and I'm proud of it. But that you know, it was a different world, a different time. It was an administration that was so solidly with us that really it was our imagination that was a limit. And you know, trying to think of something pragmatic and realistic and affordable, but we thought of a lot of stuff. 
Is there any question about that? Yeah. Others? Uh, I Maurice? Saw, yeah. Yes. Maurice Kerr. Early, early in your talk, you said something about tolerance that I rarely hear people say or acknowledge it, that there is a downside to that yeah. concept. <laughs> and I can imagine that you've encountered it over and over yeah. again, and obviously not in that setting that you just described. Yeah. Um, how, how do you get people to see that? Tolerance is an insufficient yeah. gift, as you can imagine, to others. Well, I think the easiest way to do that is to simply say, you can, you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're open to tolerate diversity. <laughs> Are you ready to celebrate? And just that simple question alone is like an entirely different spin on it. It's like, wait a minute, you mean I actually have to celebrate it? And, it, you know, that's the inventory of like, oh, maybe there are some gifts here that are worth celebrating. They may not come up with that, but I, I can suggest a whole bunch. And getting that conversation going, and I mean, think about Mickey, for instance, the trans people. We've lived in both worlds. I mean, I'm, I was a mole in the male world. <laughs> and I've got stuff I can share with you. <laughs> and you know, I'm able to get a little facetious, but you know, people who've had journeys like mine and people throughout any marginalized group have a different experience of life. And we have perspectives and, and ways of looking at the world that are illuminating, that are enriching, that are humanizing, that are powerful if we're allowed and tolerated, but not just that, actually embraced and then celebrated as people that are not just will put up with you, we really value you. I mean, that's a message we should say to everybody. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I've had um, professors, other intellectuals, uh, well, argue about the concept. Yeah. of tolerance and trying to attach a value in a way that I couldn't buy. Well, tolerance as a level, I mean, you know, yeah, I don't buy it either because it's one step too low. But the level for me is human dignity. <coughs> the threshold of, you know, keeping us as a planet together, as humanity together, is the universal right, not just recognition, but respect for human dignity. That's not a tolerance. Mm -hmm. You know, if people really all have dignity, we celebrate that because it's us too, and we're all in this together. So if their dignity is worth it, my dignity is worth it. I'm not going to tolerate my dignity. <laughs> On the other hand, let me speak a word for tolerance, which I think you just did. Yeah. Which is. If your brothers and sisters are being murdered because they're not recognized as human, yeah. then at least the step of saying you are a human being that we recognize as a human, yeah. and although we don't understand you, we won't kill you. Yeah. My sense that tolerance is still a limited virtue and value in those places where the the idea gay people don't exist in our culture or transgender people yeah. don't exist in our culture and we make sure of it because when we find anybody that doesn't fit yeah. we get rid of them because we know they don't exist yeah. really yeah. so some tolerance i think is worth than celebrating, <laughs> even if it's limited. <laughs> Chloe, I remember uh, I met you several years ago uh, when we were at the lovely community of Adolfi. Mm -hmm. And I have other transgender friends, but none of them has kids. And I, I remember seeing you with your daughter at meeting for worship several times. I was wondering, if in this process of liberation that you help us to understand tonight, yeah. how, how do you support 
your key yeah. to navigate this process as you were living it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because I think that there are many people out there that may be asking that question for themselves, but don't have any clue. So. Yeah. That's a, a big part of my book, actually, was addressing that. And it's, it was the hardest single part of my transition, is how do we tell the children? Mm. Uh, my ex-wife, who's still my best friend, um, we worked hard on that before we ever did tell the children. Got lots of good advice from people. It was still terrifying, because they're just so vulnerable. Mm. And they don't have the emotional or intellectual capacity to make sense of it. All they have is the trust in your love. And that's all you need. And that's really what it came down to. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard for me to talk about it even still, but it's in the book. And I would, mm. I'm not going to say much more about it because I'll just start to cry. But it's, kids know where love is there. And, you know, the bigger message, and I told my son, and he was 12 at the time, that I, I would not be able to be there anymore as Stephen. I just couldn't stay alive as Stephen. And I will always love you as Chloe. And there were a lot of tears. But he heard that message. And we, I'm very close with both of my kids now. In fact, my daughter's a really big LGBTQ ally activist. <laughs> so, and I'm sure he is too, but he's a Peace Corps volunteer. He's got other things to do right now. But, you know, with children, it's about what matters the most. Uh, one interesting anecdote about that that people told us is, you know, this was still, I was still presenting this now. They said, before you put on the dress, <laughs> Go and talk to the parents of the, the kids' friends. You know, all of their best friends sit down with the parents on their own and tell them. Because the first thing those little friends are going to do when they come in and see you dressed as a woman is, you know, run home with the great scandalous story. And everything depends on how the parents react. Mm -hmm. If the parents just say, you know, well, yeah, that happens, then some people find that they were in the wrong body. And if they're just cool and calm about it, the kids move right on. Mm -hmm. And it worked, I mean, I went to see 12 different couples, but <laughs> the kids had a lot of good friends. And those were funny stories too. But anyway, it worked. And it worked remarkably to keep a safe space. They, the kids did not have to be bullied or harassed by their friends. I did stay away from my son's school for a year. He did ask me to do that. And that was a really absolutely reasonable request. But you know, he went to Sandy Spring Friends School. And he got such great support from that community. And that community was really, really behind what I was doing too. They understood it. They asked me to come in and talk to the faculty and staff to help them understand it. They wanted to know how they could be there, not just for Ian, but for whenever this happened again. And it was a remarkable relationship that we developed there. So help me figure out what this question is, because I know I'm supposed to ask it, but I can't quite complete it. Okay. Um, I had a sense that in the um, late 80s, when we were, uh, when Quaker, when liberal Quakerism was struggling about whether we were really going to celebrate same-sex marriage, yeah. I continued to have the experience of going to same-sex weddings and ex and seeing, pe seeing straight people transformed by the experience of attending those. Mm -hmm. And I had this sense that in business meeting we were often debating or discerning around notions and that we didn't actually have the experience that would allow us to then set test whether spirit was present in a similar way in same-sex marriages. So I guess I'm, I, I feel some similarity on people's fear and judgment around issues of uh, transgender, whether transgender people are normal and moral and yeah. God's way. How, how do we learn to notice 
um, what's holding us back to wait for experience? How do we notice what is cultural when we're when we're acting from cultural norms and when what spirit is really asking us to do is go experience the unknown before we bring that judgment about what mm. how is spirit yeah. really moving in the world. I, I could see it, but I'm not sure I know how to see my own places of um, of um, training, you know, when is it training and when is it real morality and spirit guiding me? You know, I wish I had an easy answer. I mean, that's the main reason I wrote this book, was to humanize at least one trans person, to get over the stereotypes. The stereotypes are really pernicious. Mm -hmm. You know, we're the butt of humor, we're, you know, we're just an easy target for basically anybody. You can see what the Trump administration is doing with us. We're an easy football for them to kick around. We, it's just, we're a very vulnerable, very small group. What's different from us and gay and lesbian people is we're so few. You know, with gay and lesbians, everybody knows somebody and often really knows them well and loves them and cares deeply about good old Uncle Fred who happens suddenly to turn out to be gay. And we're not going to chuck Uncle Fred and he's our dearest good old uncle. You know, these are people that through this, what is called contact theory, and it all happened kind of with Harvey Milk and people from that point onwards, everybody came out kind of all at once. Mm -hmm. And we all had to grow into that space. and. It was such an important transition because we had to do some work in an uncomfortable environment. We had to just deal with our own bias, our own bigotry, and our own fear, and our own ignorance, and just say, these are wonderful human beings, and we loved them before. I'm not going to stop loving them now. For trans people, it's a lot harder, not only in the sense that, and I'm not trying to compare, you know, our journeys much worse than yours, but in the sense that, first of all, there's so few of us. Most people, there are more people now than ever before that have at least met or had some connection knowingly with the trans people, with the trans person. But there, it's never going to be. The demographics just aren't there for that many people to get to know people like me very well. It's just there are not enough of us around. So that's a challenge. We're always going to be, you know, the Caitlyn Jenner, or we're going to be, you know, somebody like that that's just more of another media person. And that's hard, because media people don't really, they're not warm flesh and blood for most people. So we don't have the human connection. That's, that's why it's going to take so much longer. What we do have is people like me telling our stories. And what drives me to you know, travel all these miles is, and I'm traveling a lot more this week, I'm doing three more book events on the West Coast, is to start doing that work, to start saying, you know, we're not scary. We're just people. It is uncomfortable for Quakers, for all of us, because, you know, a lot of trans people are uncomfortable to be around, especially in transition. You know, they don't look like I do. I mean, I, nobody ever knows I'm transgender until I tell them. But that's not the case for a lot of trans people. And we have to just deal with that. We have to just say, this doesn't matter. And it's not just trans people, it's gender queer people too. Mm -hmm. There are a growing number of particularly young people that say, you know, this binary doesn't work. And we don't know what to do with that. They make us so uncomfortable. We don't know what pronouns they use, we don't know what to, you know, we don't know where to go with that. So this is a challenge. And all I can say is that we're just going to have to sit with the discomfort, and each one of us is going to have to find their way out of this. Uh, that's not a very happy answer, but it's the best I can offer. And I would challenge particularly transgender men to be more present, because trans men tend to just really quickly disappear into the, into the backdrop. And I don't blame them. I mean, if I could just be Chloe the rest of my life, I would love it. But I'm transgender Chloe for a lot of important reasons at certain times. I mean, I don't go around with a name tag that says transgender Chloe, but, you know, I, there are teaching moments and spiritual enlightenment moments where I'm transgender. But a lot of trans men, for you know, they don't want to have to deal with that. And when, when, a, when a transgender man transitions, 
starts taking testosterone and voice drops, they go to facial hair, they have to have top surgery, usually. But they bulk up their muscles. I mean, they are really guys. Nobody would ever grow a big beard. I mean, they are men. And they just, usually short men, but I mean, they are right out there in society and they just completely get immersed in their stealth. And we need their voices. We need their voices as much as trans women's voices. We need their leadership as much as our, my leadership and our trans women's leadership. And they haven't shown up yet. So I'm. I'm not the only one pushing them, and I'm one of the best friends of trans men, and I yeah. tell them this too. You need to be there. You need to be there. We need you in the struggle too. I'm sensitive to time, and I know that the bookstore needs to close at some point. So. Um, we have time for another question, if there is one. Okay. Michael, Jack? <laughs> Are you questioning whether you have a question? <laughs> okay, well, let's see if something comes out. Thank you. Um, so, uh, you spoke a lot here, and uh, we spoke briefly earlier about um, the ways in which personal liberation can enable one to be there for, for others, to, yeah. to work towards liberation of others. I wonder, too, um, whether and, and in what ways working towards the liberation of others has helped um, helped uh, enable your personal liberation. Um, yeah. And and if yeah. you know the way, the ways in which those two aspects of of, the, of work towards liberation are reciprocal. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah, I'd say an easy one in a sense because it's all about relationships. Mm. You know, these are not stereotypes, these are not figures, these are real life flesh and blood friends of mine in developing countries who are really, really having tough times. And, you know, I visit them, I work with them, I write to them all the time. Half of my Facebook list is Africans. <laughs> you know, it's just these are people that they all call me mom. They write to me to tell me what they're doing that day. I mean, it's just a connection for them. But just to know that somebody cares about them, and that caring about them and their connection with me is, is reciprocal. I mean, it's, it's a really important thing for both of us. You know, this is not an abstraction for me. It's a real life people in really hard places who desperately need some liberation of their own. And I'm not going to offer that. I don't have that power. I'll listen to them and I'll communicate with them. I mean, they're my friends. I'm going to find time every, and I do every day. I have some very good friends, LGBT, mostly gay friends, um, in Kakuma Refugee Camp in Northwest Kenya, mm -hmm. who have a really, really hard time. They've been sequestered in one part of the camp where they put all the gay people, they don't even know what trans is. <laughs> and they are not allowed, they're essentially not allowed, not so much allowed, they're not able to go anywhere else in that camp. Because everybody beats them up. You know, they're refugees. They just they get really badly attacked. The trouble is the Trump administration has cut the World Food Program funding so drastically now that there's not enough money in the UNHCR to, to feed people in these camps anymore. So what they've been doing is coming up with income generating activities for the refugees so they can earn the extra food money so that they can stay alive. Well, the income generating activities are on the other side of the camp. So my friends are quite literally starving to death right now. And I'm doing all I can to every advocacy source I have to raise their plight and talk about them and let people know their names. And really just, you'll see it on my Facebook page a lot. And I hear from them every other day, every third day, and they, they're about to lose hope. I mean, it's just so desperate for them right now. But you know what's really interesting? <laughs> and it shows you something about the human spirit. This is Pride Month. Mm -hmm. Those gay guys, and there's a few lesbians, I don't know if there's trans people there, they haven't come out if they are, are going to have a Pride event. These are people who are starving, mm -hmm. who are struggling day to day. 
But they know how important solidarity is. They know how important that cohesion is for any prospect they have. That they, if they're on their own, they're dead. So they are going to have an event, and they've been saving money, and they're going to do something. I mean, it's not going to be grand and glorious, but they're going to be assert, they're going to be asserting their dignity, and I'm going to be doing all I can to, to trumpet that, to just say, look at this, isn't this amazing? And how about let's do something better for them? I don't mean that we're here to solve all their problems, but we can at least raise the awareness of the people to what this administration's you know, consequences of what they're, I mean, the cuts in foreign aid are already huge. The cuts in humanitarian assistance across the board are already huge. I mean, the cut in basic food supplies. This is what this government is doing right now. And people are dying. And, you know, some of those people are very marginalized, vulnerable people. And it's not just LGBTQ people. It's persons with disabilities. It's all kinds of people who are marginalized. They are the ones at the sharp end of the spear right now. And it's not okay. And that's all I can do is just keep sharing that experience and that, those friendships and say, these are real people and I love them. And I'm going to continue to love them and care for them and do what I can to tell their story. And I, I do lots of blogging and I do lots of, I love to write and that's a gift for me. But I put it towards human rights advocacy as much as I can. Can I ask a brief follow-up sure. question? Um, yeah, I, I, um, I wonder how um, I mean, it, it seems to me that um, that part of what, what you're saying is that, or what I hear you saying is that that's and I believe this to be true, that story has the ability to bridge the gap between experiences. Between, mm -hmm. you know. um, I wonder, um, what, this is a huge question, I guess, which you, I suppose you don't actually have to answer, but, what what can be done um, to uplift voices and stories which you know often go unheard, um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, I suppose this is not not a very well framed question, but I I wonder if you could speak both to to um, yeah, that, that ability of story to create, to build bridges between experiences, you know, especially when, um, especially with those different from, you know, who have different experiences from oneself, and um, the ways in which um, story might be used to try and heal some of those, um, yeah. you know, those wounds and those thoughts. I think it's, it's a, I mean, story for the sake of story can be a diversion. I think it's so important that we're using story, but it be grounded in a truth. Mm. A truth that's really important. And the stories that are matter the most for me in this context are human dignity stories. That's the threshold we cannot go below. And if we can fight for that threshold, if we can tell that kind of story, if we can bring the humanity of these people to the place where their dignity matters and the threat to their dignity is understood, that's all we can do. And we can't solve all those problems. The world's a big place and there's extraordinary levels of injustice, but there's also extraordinary levels of love and compassion. Um, I'm gonna just end by just reading uh, something that relates to that. And I, I think you'll see why. In the end, the pronouns, stereotypes, and labels won't matter. We will stand or fall on our humanity and on our dignity. Refusing to accept our assertion of our gender is nothing less than a rejection of that humanity and that dignity after we put it all on the line. While we won't bend to letting others define us, we do need to live, work, love, 
and play in the society of human beings. We are who we say we are. And while it isn't much to ask of others, it is everything to us. I am Chloe. Except that I am here, female and very human, fierce yet vulnerable, tough yet sensitive, with a heart filled with love and warmth. I'm at peace with who I am. I've struggled so hard for so long against such outrageous odds just to be able to write those words. I'm selfish. I have to be. Find room in your heart for me and for transgender people everywhere, and your heart will grow. It's a pretty good deal. Thank you. And there are 10 copies of this book, or nine now, I guess, in the bookstore. And if you want to buy them, I'll be happy to sign something on them. Great, and if you could go ahead and do that, there were some refreshments out in the kitchenette and a table for Chloe to sign books, and the bookstore will be open for a short while, so get them while they're hot. Yeah, I think that